Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Uh, today we're going to be looking at one of the most difficult species of lizards to, act, to keep alive in captivity, that is the flying lizards, or Draco, whose name actually means dragon. These animals are incredible. They're very small, but they, they have bones that resemble wings that, that fold open with flaps of skin, usually very colorful flaps of skin, that allow these animals to glide through the treetops. So they've obviously captured the imagination of reptile lovers for a very long time. But up until recently, they've basically been considered impossible to keep alive, let alone breed in captivity. Um, but over the past year or so that I've been working with them, I have had some limited success keeping them alive. I do have imported animals that have been with me for over a year now and are doing just fine. And I have had some success actually breeding them, raising some babies up. So stick around and find out what I do to keep this very difficult species alive. I'm Frank Payne, biology teacher, reptile breeder, and former zookeeper. I'm here to share with you my passion and experience working with these beautiful and fascinating animals. Welcome to Living Art. Before I get into what I do to take care of these animals and to breed them, I do want to start off by saying that unless you are very experienced uh, keeping and breeding lizards, especially with acclimating wild caught lizards, do not buy these guys. It's very tempting. They're cheap usually at shows when they do come in, but literally only one other person in this country has produced them, has produced captive bred babies. Um, 99.999% of the ones that have come in die relatively quickly. They are a delicate species to acclimate. They're very little, they're easily dehydrated. By the time they come in, they are not in great shape and they just don't do well. So unless you have a lot of experience acclimating wild caught animals and are planning to buy a large group of them to actually try to breed them in captivity, don't do it. They aren't good pets. Wait until myself or Charles McAllister or hopefully somebody else in the future breeds them to buy them as a pet. But if you are an experienced lizard keeper, then hopefully what I tell you will help you out a little bit. Record, go ahead. Ah. Okay. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, so this is one of my flying lizards. This is actually a captive bred male. Um, this one was produced by the only other breeder of this species that I'm aware of, Charles McAllister. Um, I got him to pair him up with some of my wild caught females because uh, I wanted a nice healthy captive bred male to, to get with my girls. And he is a very feisty guy. Um, I, I never hold these animals. They're, they're very small. Uh, see if you can zoom in a little bit so you can really look at him much, much prettier than I am. Um, but he is so he's very feisty and he does not like being handled at all and i so i rarely do this so please don't think that i handle this animal all the time um or i don't mess with them that much this is strictly for your benefit so you can see this pretty incredible animal he actually just bit me pretty solid and believe it or not they got some strong fangs maybe you can see it there and it really does surprisingly smart when these little guys bite uh, they have some two fangs in the top of their jaw and bottom of their jaw. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, this is a male. He's got a very big throat fan. Hopefully I can get him to display a little bit. I don't want to mess with him too awful much. Ooh, come here, buddy. Beautiful throat fan, which he extends out to impress the ladies. I won't mess with that too much. And then, of course, what makes these animals so special is this right there their wings of course they're not real wings but they're extendable bones with lots of beautiful skin under uh in between there that they do extend out so they can glide through the treetops this species that i work with is draco maculatus or the spotted flying lizard they do have some spots here and there what's amazing about these animals is that they do change color quite a bit and, and especially when they're very healthy wild caught or a, a healthy captive bred one like this they they exhibit some pretty amazing color changing ability that rivals chameleons and europlatus leaf tail geckos their 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 coloration is amazing for blending in uh, and while i am holding this guy now it's strictly for the be benefit of you guys to see him there's they're a, a look and don't touch species for sure even as captive bred um, 
they're small they're delicate they are relatively fast um, but what's great is they do sit out all of the time they're very visible they're not shy even the wild caught ones in my experience they are out and about all the time so the very first thing and the most important thing that you should focus on if you do get some wild caught draco is hydration they come in quite dehydrated most of the time you need an automatic misting system nothing else will suffice in my opinion you need an automatic misting system to acclimate them you're going to have to mist heavily and frequently a lot and a spray bottle you're not going to be able to mist long enough and also the water droplets will be too big very fine mist um, multiple times a day letting them drink their fill and focusing on that um, not focusing on feeding or anything like that right away. I never treated mine. I never gave them panicure or flagell or anything like that. I just focused on hydration and that worked. And of the, the decent sized group that I uh, started with, all but one survived. They all did very well. Um, finding healthy animals I think is very important as well. Um, examine the animals yourself. Don't buy them from a place online unless you're getting individual pictures because if they don't look good, don't get them. And if you can't tell the difference between what a good looking wild caught lizard looks like and what a, a not good looking wild caught lizard looks like, do not buy them, all right? Mist frequently and heavily allow them to drink. They are a tropical species. They want it warm. We're talking high 80s, um, at, in the warmest spot, even a little bit um, higher basking, maybe in the 90s. Don't let it get cold. I've found that they do not like it cool. They can handle it, especially the adults, if it gets down into the 60s, um, but they don't seem to like it as well as, as much at all, and the babies especially don't seem to do well with that. So keep it warm, mid to high 70s for an ambient, even up into the 80s, basking, higher 80s, low 90s, something like that feeding these animals are strictly insectivores um, there was this myth going around for a very long time that maybe the reason why these animals didn't do well in captivity is because they are obligate ant eaters um, and that's simply not the case they do not need ants to survive they, they are probably uh, eating them in the wild but i have never fed them the other uh, breeder of this species in uh, does not feed them ants they don't need it they don't need formic acid it's simply a myth um, i feed mine uh, adults, quarter inch crickets, bean beetles, and several species of fruit fly. I feed them pretty much every other day. So basically three to four times a week is what I'm feeding them. Um, small insects, these are small animals with small heads and they're just picking off little insects frequently. I dust everything with all their food insects with Rapashi Calcium Plus on every single feeding. In terms of lighting, they are a diurnal, day active, heliolithic, sun worshiping species. Um, strong UV light, I think, is very important. Um, I use Reptisun 10.0 T5 high output bulbs, uh, as well as an additional T5 just plant bulb. So strong, strong UV and fluorescent lighting uh, or LED lighting, whatever, as long as it's very bright white light in addition to having to the UV light. Here's one of my enclosures, uh, like pretty much everything I keep uh, right now is in PVC enclosures. Um, this is um, a 24 inch deep, 16 inch high and 12 inches wide enclosure. If you can give them bigger, give them bigger. Uh, please keep in mind that I am a breeder with a fairly large collection and therefore my cage sizes tend to be on the, on the smaller side. Um, it works obviously, but if you are able to provide larger. so. Here you can get an idea of how I set it up. Super, super simple. Um, this does house a gravid female right now. So there, there she is. You can see that belly is nice and big. This girl will be giving me eggs in just a, maybe a week or two, I think, at this point. Um, in my experience, they lay four, clutch, four eggs in a clutch, and they lay um, a clutch of eggs about every month uh, in their breeding season, and I have seen them had them uh, retain sperm from one mating. I do keep them singly at all times. They're very territorial and aggressive and they do stress out when kept together. Do not keep these animals in groups. Keep them individually and only introduce for breeding. This is a girl, she doesn't have that big dewlap like the male has. Head shape is a little bit different too. No hem and penile bulges. But you can see how I keep them uh, pretty thick um, branches which I've cut to fit wedged a, a bunch up um, vertically that's how they like to spend most of their time hanging vertically like that some diagonal ones too 
they aren't geckos they can't um, or anolis lizards they don't have the sticky toe pads they're not sticking to the pvc if you can provide cork paneling on the sides and back of your enclosure even better i think that would be much better for them providing larger surface area screen enclosures do work for them um, people use them but uh, because they do have the correct format but um, it's hard to hold humidity so make sure that you're, you would have to be misting a whole lot more and keeping that humidity up very high especially at night i like to use pothos in a lot of my enclosures everything i keep is pretty much bioactive with soil that she will lay in and it'll be very obvious when she lays uh, because she'll look deflated right now she looks pretty big she will get even bigger over the next week or two and then she'll dig and lay and it'll be very obvious because she will look like a deflated balloon but there it is fairly straightforward fairly simple there's the misting nozzle don't mind the cobwebs there's the t5 light Okay, let's talk breeding. So once the animals are very well acclimated, if you have gotten to that point, if you have kept your animals alive for three months or so, awesome, congratulations. You're one of few people that can do that. Uh, but if you have done that, then now you can probably start to try to breed. Don't try and rush it. The animals, especially the female, must be in tip top shape in order to breed. Then what I do is I introduce the male into the female's enclosure. Um, or vice versa. I usually put the male in with the female um, and then leave him in there with her for about three or four days. He'll display. I've never actually seen them mate. They seem to be a little shy about actually mating in front uh, of me. So, but I just kind of leave them alone, let them do their thing. Um, but then remove the male after three or four days. The female, like you saw before, balloons up. She'll dig and lay her eggs. She likes a pretty warm temperature to lay her eggs, high 70s. Uh, in order to lay her eggs and feel comfortable digging it in there. Um, after that, it takes uh, a very short amount of time for those eggs to hatch, uh, uh, about 45 days if you are incubating in the, the high 70s, like 79, 78 is what I shoot for. Um, the first clutch of eggs that I got, I incubated them in the, the mid 80s or so, um, and they hatched in 30 days, but the babies were very weak and did not survive. When I switched to high 70s, the incubation took longer, 45 days, but the babies hatched out much stronger and more vigorous, and the ones that did survive um, were, were at those temperatures. The babies are delicate. I am not an expert with this species at all. I have only been working with them for about a year but I do have some babies that are now approaching one third and even half grown. I have lost a lot of babies. I'm still learning. I'm trying to figure out what those babies need in order to thrive. I found the adults to be quite hardy once established, but the babies I'm struggling with. I'm still figuring it out. I still wanted to put this video out there to hopefully help people uh, because they do come in uh, and I do want people to be successful with them. Again, do not recommend it unless you are very well experienced with wild caught lizards, but hopefully this will help you and I will continue to post my progress as I learn more about them. Thank you very much for joining me guys. I hope that you learned a little bit. I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, and again, I can't stress enough. Do not buy these lizards unless you feel very comfortable acclimating wild caught lizards and have a lot of experience with it. I know I sound like a broken record, but I think it's very important because otherwise they just don't do well. I will post updates as I learn more, as I progress in my understanding of them. I'm not gonna have any for sale anytime soon. I'm gonna hold back the captive bred babies that I produce for at least a year or so until I figure them out more. Hopefully I'll get to a point where I'll have more success with the babies and be able to produce captive bred Draco. They are fairly prolific once you get them going. If I can figure out those babies, we'll be in good shape. So I'll look for more Draco videos in the future. Uh, if this is your first time here, please do give my channel a subscribe, like this video, share it around, I'm trying to get this, uh, get some legs underneath it. So I really do appreciate your support and I'll see you next time. Thank you.